Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode six of Pricing Matters. This is a series of discussions we plan for 2020 around various topics that we think are under discussed and interesting in pricing and how it's changing with technology. Today's topic is subscription pricing, and our guest is a guru in the matter, although he may cringe at that. Uh, Patrick Campbell, the CEO of ProfitWell. Thanks so much for joining us, Patrick. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me, man. I'm definitely cringing at that, but I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> All right. Well, it's it's great to have you on, and it's always fun to to geek out on pricing topics. I think the first time we met over at the uh, the Drift uh, Hypergrowth Conference, we started to geek out a little bit too much. But uh, so it's good to have a little bit of a, <laughs> a forum that's dedicated to the topic here. Um, so um, let's start off with kind of talking a little bit about what you do at ProfitWell and Price Intelligently. Do you, you want to explain that to the listeners a little bit? Yeah, definitely. So we, we've we evolved into, we have multiple products now. And so we, we actually started off um, specifically in the pricing space um, and we still have that product. We work um, mainly with subscription companies uh, doing research in the market to help with their pricing. But now we have kind of a suite of different revenue operations products that help with revenue automation. Uh, so we have a free subscription financial metrics product that basically plugs into your billing system and gives you all of your financial metrics. Um, and then we have couple of products and the way we make money is through the pricing product, um, a product that helps with retention and then um, one that helps with revenue recognition. So yeah, it's one of those things where it's, 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 it's been a fun journey so far that kind of started in monetization. And, and now what's kind of cool is we have about 20%, uh, depending on how you measure it, of the entire subscription market using our metrics product. And so there's a lot of data um, that you and I have geeked out about that we've been able to kind of study um, of what's working, what's not, not only when it comes to pricing, but also, you know, just different aspects of the subscription world. Right. Yeah. So some of the key metrics that I've seen are around like churn and retention and Obviously, there's the pricing angle. You want to talk a little bit more about some of those other key metrics that are that subscription companies care about? Yeah, that's that's a wormhole. So let me let me think through maybe a couple. Maybe things. just the top think, few. Yeah. Oh, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, I think ultimately, I mean, it's it's it, you know this like it's it's metrics are only as good as the use case, right? And so I think when you think about a subscription company, you know, like all companies, you have three areas of growth: acquire customers, monetize, and retain them. Um, and some of the metrics that I think that are are kind of you know more of the god metrics besides growth, obviously, which is the ultimate god metric, are things like lifetime value, um, their overall net retention, as you kind of mentioned. Um, and then when it comes to pricing, I think that the, the big number that you should be focused on, at least in my opinion, to to you know see if it goes up, not necessarily wanting it to go up at the expense of other metrics, is uh, your ARPU, your average revenue per user. And uh, you may measure that as ACV or um, ARPA, our average revenue per account. But just the the amount of the uh, revenue you're getting per customer, um, you want that number kind of going up into the right uh, over time. Absolutely. What have you seen with regards to customer acquisition costs lately? Um, speaking mm -hmm. of metrics, because that's one that you know is also a key key one for you know all different types of subscription companies, including ourselves. And um, you know we've been um, you know tracking it closely. And I was just wondering, you know, what you see as the trends overall in uh, enterprise software, but also generally in in subscription businesses. Yeah, they're not good, depending on how you look at them. <laughs> so, <laughs> what? If you think about it, and not to go way too far back, but uh, over the past 20 years, we basically have had this really interesting trend, uh, particularly in software, but I would also argue in a lot of businesses that have anything to do with the internet, which is mostly everyone, uh, where, you know, basically from, you know, the 90s, probably around 2000, 2005, you know, all the way through 2020, making product or uh, shipping features, these types of things have, have gotten relatively inexpensive. Um, they're still expensive, don't get me wrong, but relative to needing a server room and a bunch of people to manage servers and things like that, it's gotten cheaper. We've been able to ship faster and faster. And if you really think about the last kind of age of product, um, it was very focused on how do we ship as quickly as possible, the rise of Agile, Kanban, a bunch of these different things um, in the world of software. Now, similarly, 
what happened is over, you know, kind of 2003 to 2015, we were getting a brand new marketing channel like every single quarter. You know, Google AdWords for a penny a click, remarketing, Google Display Network, all kinds of crazy stuff. And so if you were building a company in the past 20 years, it was kind of an amazing time where it's it wasn't easy, but you were riding these waves of, you know, cost effectiveness as well as like so many acquisition channels. And what this caused, um, which is, you know, a wave that a lot of us have ridden is just this deluge of tons and tons of companies. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I think uh, in the past five, six years, competitors have gone up about 4x um, just because there's so many people out there competing for attention. And we haven't had a brand new marketing channel since 2015. Uh, TikTok is still a little TBD, whether it's going to be effective in D2C, let alone B2B software. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is one of those things where you, you now are seeing essentially CAC or customer acquisition costs up over the past six years by about 70% on a blended basis. Uh, and there are some channels that are faring a little bit better than others, but overall costs have gone, you know, way up, um, you know, over the years, which is kind of to be expected. And, and that's not great, but the silver lining is in it is it's causing us to look at acquisition as almost table stakes where we have to be good at it to survive, you know, sales mm -hmm. and marketing. Um, mm -hmm. But now where hyper growth comes from is monetization and also retention when you're looking at a subscription business. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that there's definitely an increased focus on that. And I mean, in our business, we have quite high retention. So it's so high, it's actually difficult to actually calculate lifetime value. So That's we great. look at we look it, it's great, but it's also kind of problematic when you look at some of these, you know, uh, the CAC versus lifetime value and, and, you mm. know, that kind of thing. So, um, but yeah, we've seen some of those similar trends and it's, it's, uh, it's good to hear that it's not just us, but, uh, but at the same time, um, you know, I know that you also do these, these pricing teardown pages and, uh, you know, and I, I love those. Um, and we had talked a little bit about that, um, yesterday and, uh, maybe you can get into it a, a little bit, um, and talk about some of your favorite ones that you've done or some, maybe some of the upcoming ones that you want to share, uh, with the listeners. Yeah, totally. So we, yeah, we have this series called pricing page teardown, which, uh, we originally thought only pricing people will like it, uh, which isn't necessarily our target customer. And so we were like, why are we doing this? Right. But basically we, we collect a bunch of data, you know, using our software on, the brand that we're going to talk about that week. And then what we end up doing is basically, uh, you know, tearing down the pricing page and seeing what's good and what's bad and what we can all learn from it. Right. And we don't have any inside knowledge. So sometimes it's hard to know, oh, did they make that decision because of this or that? But, you know, it's still entertaining and educational, I would say. Uh, and, you know, what, what we've kind of learned after looking at a lot of different pricing pages is that uh, effort really pays off, which I know sounds kind of ridiculous and a little condescendingly pedantic, but it's it's one of those things where you can see the brands who have really kind of thought through not only the user experience of going through their pricing page, but also have thought through about you know which segments that they're selling into, and then based on those segments, what they're going to present, and then you can kind of see their flows past that initial purchase. Um, one of the ones I am a little bit excited about um, coming up in the next season is actually Twitter, uh, which is um, you know obviously doesn't have a subscription right now. They've hinted a little bit here and there that they might come out with one, but. It's it's something that you kind of see in the market where the the ad kind of monetization model is works really well for some brands and then just doesn't work that well for others. And Twitter, you know, ads have been great. Obviously, it's it's you know the revenue stream that they've had, but they're not getting you know Facebook like scale, right? Just because they're not you know gaining as many users. So we were thinking, oh, it'd be really interesting if they have a subscription. And then you know we recorded that episode already, and then after we recorded it, they were they came out of, oh yeah, we're going to consider one, and we're like, ah, we got to get the episode out. But I'm excited <laughs> for that one in particular. Nice. Great. And and I, I know you had uh, also had some interesting takeaways from the teardown that you did on, on Salesforce. Can you talk a little bit about that one? Yeah, Salesforce is one of those, I think it's it's kind of like alluding to Apple sometimes. Uh, there's a lot that went right and they've been around for a long time. And so it's sometimes hard to learn from them. But I think that when you look at Salesforce, what was interesting about studying them is if you just look at their pricing page, and let's talk about their, their sales CRM product it's it's a lot um they have lots of different um lots of different features so many add-ons so many different things because again they've been around for you know 20 some years now and i think what's really really interesting about salesforce is that mm -hmm. they even with those constraints were able to come up with 
uh, a pricing page that, yes, is sometimes hard to navigate, but still gives you complete information in a fairly organized way. And they are really, really good about separating out features that are kind of what I would say unapologetic about their personas or the segments that they target. And what I mean by that is if you are, you know, I, I, I'm, we're a perfect example as a company. When we first started, you know, when it was just five of us, uh, we were, oh, we should use Salesforce because that's what our, you know, salesperson at the time had used previously. But we were also using HubSpot, right? And we were kind of more sophisticated in other areas of our business versus, you know, just one salesperson. Well, we wanted the HubSpot integration and the HubSpot integration was available to us, but the API calls on the integration weren't available until we were up on the next tier. And it's for us, it was a little frustrating because we were like, well, we have to upgrade in order to get this, but we weren't really that great of a persona for them in using HubSpot and things like that. And so I think that I love when I find brands who are okay giving up or, you know, ruffling some of the feathers of certain types of segments that just aren't their target because they're so focused on who they're going after. And it's kind of cool to see that Salesforce was able to do that, even though they're obviously, you know, a giant, giant company. Yeah. Yeah, we were. So I, when I was at Cisco Systems, we were one of the early, I think we were the biggest enterprise deal that they had ever signed at the time. Mm. Uh, it was like 6,000 seats, which was that was in That's wild. I think 2001, 2002 or something like that. And um, it was, uh, yeah. And so, and we, I saw, I was actually party to some of the negotiations that were going back and forth, but it was a lot simpler then. It was really just a per seat, you know, they didn't have CPQ, they didn't have the marketing, they, you know, they didn't have a lot of the stuff that they have now. So the over time, it's, yeah, it's gotten, yeah, with those bells and whistles, it gets a little bit more complicated. Um, you know, the, the other thing that I kind of have from that experience with regards to subscriptions um, was um, when we they actually had formed a SWAT team at Cisco in kind of the early 2000s that I was part of when we were looking at what we call then managed services, right, which is mm -hmm. now, you know, uh, at, you know, whatever AAS, right, SAS or PASS or you know, AS or whatever, you know, the different terms are now. Um, but we, we started looking at it for, especially around IP telephony, right? So because customers had basically said, look, we don't, we don't care to buy, uh, you know, a switch and a bunch of phones. We want to buy, we want to pay $5 per user per month for their phones. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, and, and, uh, and so, uh, you know, we started doing some analysis and looked at like, what are the implications of that? And we, and it really touched almost every single business process that we had, right? And so, and I think a lot of companies are looking at subscription right now, especially like more established hardware companies that have, you know, processes that are set up to sell widgets at a certain price and moving that over into, you know, the, the subscription model can really be a challenge. And so I was just wondering if you could provide some some guidance and insight, like as you're going through that process, uh, to companies that are considering it on how how to get started and and you know what they should be thinking about during that. Yeah, so I think that so so basically how to move from like a traditional model to like a subscription model, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think that what's what's tough about this is that you and I can probably look at this and go into any company, you know, being in the in the pricing game here and, and probably figure out their pricing relatively quickly, like where the how they should. Cool. So you should have this. Let's figure out your value metric. Let's do some research. Let's look at some data in the market, et cetera. The bigger problem that ends up happening is management and internal politics. And I know that sounds bad, internal politics, like, oh, we don't have it. Like everyone has internal politics, just kind of how it happens. And because you have to kind of think about, and this is where a lot of brands, especially large brands that move from kind of a uh, perpetual license model to a subscription model, you know, they had their, like, especially the public ones, they had to really educate Wall Street. Like Wall Street wasn't ready when they were, so they had to delay. And it's just, it's just a lot of moving parts. And I think that, the first thing to do is make sure that your team is very, very, very much on board and that you have um, the right pricing committee basically formed. And there's a lot of theories on pricing committees. To me, I think that you need kind of a, a leader of most of the major groups. So depending on your size and your stature, probably head of sales, head of marketing, head of product, uh, head of finance. And then if you have customer success, throw them in there. If you have a research team, that head probably should be the one doing a lot of the legwork on this stuff. But it's important to get everyone in the room and everyone on board with, hey, the reason we're going to switch to this model 
models, it's better for evaluation, it's better for our EBITDA, it's better for all these different things, but we're going to go through, and I think Zora might have been the, the team that came up with this first, the, the kind of the fish, they have this fish graphic where it's like, you know, your costs go up and then they come down and your revenue actually kind of comes down and then it goes up because it compounds, right? Because you're kind of like mm -hmm. foregoing that, you know, traditional perpetual revenue that's coming in to, to right. get a typically cheaper subscription. Once, once you kind of have that buy-in, and that's hard. That's a hard buy-in. Um, it shouldn't be, but it kind of is because everyone's a little emotional and pricing, as you know, is one of those things, unless you're a pricing team. It's just one of those things that everyone has an opinion on because it's so central to, to what you're doing um, and every team touches it in some way. So people, this is why most people don't change their pricing often enough is because they just kind of keep kicking the can down the road. Now, a little more practical beyond kind of the, the, the softer skills necessary for pricing changes, I think the number one thing, and this gets into kind of how you allude to, is that value metric, like how you charge. And right. there's typically three big features of a value metric. There's, um, you wanna make sure it's easy to understand for your sales process. So if you're doing something touchless, probably can't have like three value metrics that are really hard to calculate in the, the customer or the prospect's mind. Um, if you're doing like a big enterprise sale, you could probably have a bunch of different SLA metrics and things like that, depending on the usage of the customer. You want to simplify it, but simple is a little bit different when you're in an enterprise sale. The next thing is it has to like grow with your customer's usage or the value that they're getting. Um, and I think this is the the one that a lot of people miss out on is because they think, oh, it should be usage. Well, sometimes it's not usage. You know, big, right. back in 2005, we couldn't measure, we barely could measure usage. Um, and that's why everything was very per user or per device. Now we mm. can actually measure usage and, and sometimes it doesn't make sense. Um, but it is, it is one of those things that is, you know, super, super important when you're thinking about the new wave here that your value might be the money you bring to them. And if you can measure that the customer agrees with that that's how you should charge right you shouldn't right. find a proxy but a lot of us need to find a proxy so you want to think of what's that perfect value metric and then all of a sudden you want to take a step back and realize well we can't charge based on happiness or something like that so what's right. a proxy well a proxy might yeah. be how often they use it might be contacts for a marketing product might be something like that yeah um, yeah yeah that, that, like in our example you know we there's been a lot of discussion and a lot of kind of experimentation on, um, you know, value as a service or, or, you know, charging based on kind of gain or a gain share type of model in the pricing space and even in the pricing software space. And there's been some remarkably uh, successful attempts at that by consulting companies and, and even some software companies. But it can be pretty contentious, right, to, to assign the gains to the tool and like, well, what's people process versus systems and, you know, and... and uh, People agree with it in theory, but then it comes time to write, you know, a multi-million dollar check based on a gain share calculation that, you know, formula that you set up six months prior, it can be pretty tough. So uh, we use a proxy metric, just revenue under management. And, um, you know, we, we have a CPQ module where, uh, where we're competing a lot of times with companies that are licensing per user, which is more an efficiency metric than, a, than an effectiveness metric, right? The reason why we feel like revenue under management is a good proxy metric is because you, you're typically seeing gains of, you know, half to 4% of sales. So having that, you know, sales metric in there. Um, you know, is is what we we use, and it's simple, and we don't charge for API calls or storage or you know anything like that. So that that's a way of keeping it simple, using that you know that that uh, proxy metric to kind of approximate the value. Um, so yeah, that, yeah definitely like agree with that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think it's also you bring up you bring up a really good point if you don't mind me interjecting. Is the third thing is they have to, the customer has to agree. And I think yeah. that's 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 often what happens is everyone, especially like if you're coming out with a new product or you're like switching, you're like, well, this is how we should charge. This is the vision. I you know read it in a Fortune article or something like that, <laughs> and it's like, well, but your customer doesn't care about that or they don't agree. And this is what's funny is this kind of cuts both ways because um, I don't think CRM should be priced based on a per user basis. I don't think that's where the value is at all like in that CRM software, but it's so ingrained in how like sales managers and sales leaders buy CRM software that there's really no alternative. And everyone who's kind of tried, um, they, they're not able to get over it. So there is an yeah. element of your customer has to buy into it. Yeah, thanks Salesforce. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but 
Um, no, 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 it's fine. Yeah. That's just kind of how it is, right? And, yeah. and I think that, you know, because that's the one that they buy into so strongly, that's the right one, even though it's probably not really where the value uh, perfectly kind of scales. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, and I'd say, you know, all pricing, all, all best practices around pricing really start with the customer and understanding that value that that they get from the product, right? And, and uh, you know, I was, uh, you know, I've, I've had a, done a couple of presentations with uh, Madhavan Ramanujan from SKP, you yeah. know, who wrote Monetizing Innovation, and they kind of make the argument that, you know, you should even determine willingness to pay before before you develop a product, right? And you should actually develop the features and capabilities of the product aligned with that willingness to pay, which is unfortunately kind of the opposite way that most, especially in technology, that products are generally introduced, right? You kind of come up with an innovation and you're like, oh, this is a cool thing. And then you go and then you're, you develop it. And then it's up to like, you know, the product management team to try to figure out, okay, now what what should we charge for this, right? Taking that approach of of determining willingness to pay, but like as the product's being developed, or even you know having that uh, inform the features and capabilities of the product. So I, I was just wondering. I mean, you do a lot of kind of assessments in these pricing teardowns, and and you get involved uh, with a fair amount of companies that have existing products. Do you ever get involved in the with companies as they're developing new products? Yeah, we help with a lot of companies kind of in this process. I think that what's really interesting is you have to understand the limits of your data and the limits of your, you know, the totality of the decision that you're making, right? Because when, when you're working with a company that's just like coming out with a new product or brand new, depending on how different of a customer base they're going after, or depending on like a whole host of different things, um, it's one of those, those pieces where you have to make sure that you're continually testing through the launch and post-launch, right? Just in terms of collecting research. And this is why, you know, as I said, you guys know this better than anyone, um, you know, pricing is that process. Pricing is not like a one-time activity. Um, but some of the pitfalls that you tend to find are, you're never truly going to know what reality is until you get it out there, right? And the product is developed. But what you're trying to do with doing this research before you even put a line of code in and then during the code, you know, being, being written, um, or built if you're manufacturing, I guess, um, is you're essentially trying to figure out how do you minimize as much risk as possible, right? And so when you use these kind of models and these research methods, and there's a lot of them, and they all have pros and cons, and there's some that are really high leverage, and there's some that if you have like all of the money in the world or all the time in the world, it's totally fine to, to spend the money and the time, even though they're not necessarily like the most leveraged, but they all have limits. And when you're collecting this data, what's really kind of interesting about it is you can start to figure out, okay, the data says this, and there's some really, really obvious things that you're like, yep, that's exactly what I thought about this market. Then there's some things that you didn't think about or that you thought about that were just completely wrong that are also obvious. And then mm -hmm. the, in the middle, there's a lot of what I like to call these little margins of opportunity. And what I mean by margins of opportunity are essentially, okay, so when we're getting and going after this customer, this is the value proposition that they really, really want. So that's how we're gonna make our ads. And then when we get this customer in and they do this in X, Y, Z, this is you know what we should you know offer them up in, in, in app expansion revenue kind of opportunity. But the thing you have to think about is that it's constantly evolving and no data is going to be perfect, but that's okay. A lot of people hear that and they think, great, so now I'm supposed to not do anything. And it's like, no, 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 you're still supposed to do it. You just have to realize you're going to be looking at a bunch of different data, including the goals that your company has and the goals that they have for the product. And that's going to help you make that decision as a product leader, a marketing leader, whomever is you know, kind of making the final decision. Right. Yeah, it's good advice. Cool. So, so let's uh, let's move uh, shift gears a little bit, and uh, I want to talk about freemium pricing. Um, so, the uh, you know, I, I know I, I we kind of collaborated. I asked for to use a quote of yours from uh, from the Slack analysis that you did on the pricing teardown for them, um, and so I and I was writing an article on Slack and Fortnite pricing and. Um, nice. And I love that quote that that you that you had in there where you said Slack is about as close to pricing perfection as any company is going to get. Um, you want to talk a little bit more about like what they got right and um, and uh, you know just some of that analysis that you did there. Yes. Yeah, so Slack, uh, they're kind of like Apple, which I alluded to before too, where 
I think they did this very intentionally, but it might not have been intentional. It might just have worked out. But I think that uh, it doesn't really matter. They get the credit for it either way. I think what Slack was able to do is build a product that focused on packaging almost exclusively. And I'll explain what that means. But if you really think about Slack, the there were lots of other chat products out there. Like HipChat was out there. there there's a lot of other things out there. And yep. It, it, you know, they did hit the market at the right time. I think there was a lot more need for these these types of products um, versus, you know, the five years prior. But with their pricing, they looked at the axes that they had, and they had axes such as, um, you know, the number of messages that you could search. So basically, you could search a limit of 10,000 messages, then the number of integrations, and then there were a bunch of different features that they could kind of like separate out into different tiers. And I think what they realized through the packaging is that the big thing that the hole that was in the market was really around the integrations, like getting every single thing, Google Docs, et cetera, everything in Slack. So it's kind of like your, you know, besides email and they're trying to quote unquote kill email. I don't know if they use that that marketing speak anymore, but mm -hmm. it's kind of like your command center for your day and your business and your team. Right. Et kind of the operating operating system for the for the business, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Totally. And so the perfection came from realizing that in terms of packaging and then putting together a quite perfect uh, value metric um, for the freemium tier, which was those 10,000 messages. So as soon as you started to get, you know, it depends on the team, but 10 to 20 people inside Slack, right when you're more than happy to pay for that tool because of the efficiency and the effectiveness you're getting out of it, um, all of a sudden you're you're finding yourself not being able to search past 10,000 messages, which is really hard because you're like, oh, I want to see what that doc that John sent me the other day, I can't find it, that type of thing. And then all of a sudden you're a three-figure MRR company or customer. You know, you're at least $100, maybe, you know, $200 of a customer, which means that a lot of their unit economics don't have to worry about chasing $20 customers, which is really, really tough. Um, and then the next step up, basically the difference between their first paid tier and their second paid tier is essentially if you have a CIO or a COO, which is all the fun, you know, legal stuff and these types of things, and then you're upgrading everyone. One, and you're more than happy to upgrade everyone because you need to have that searchability, you need to have that data retention, all these different things. And then the next step up is enterprise, which they weren't doing so well for a long time, um, but it's just because they were new, you know, and they grew so quickly. So, and yeah, and whenever you have two axes, uh, one upgrading of the users and the number of like a value metric, in this case, users in an account, um, it's a really good recipe for, you know, fast growth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's multiplicative. That's great. So a lot of companies, though, have gotten freemium wrong, right? And and uh, I was wondering if you could talk about some examples up there and kind of why, you know, what they did wrong and, and what they might be able to improve or could have improved yeah. to, to make it better. I think the thing with freemium is you have to think about it as an acquisition model, not a revenue model. And I think a lot of people want to put it in pricing because because it obviously is related and, and very, very closely related. But the thing you have to think about with freemium is that you're trying to lower the activation energy of a, of a prospect becoming a lead, essentially, or becoming a prospect. And mm -hmm. with all of the CAC implications we talked about previously, one of the easiest kind of things, or it's going to be one of the easiest or low cost things to do is to offer up either a kind of MVP version of your product or even a tangential product that brings in the right type of customers. You have to think about freemium essentially as a premium ebook. Um, that's, that's the better way to think about it. And I think where people get this wrong is first, they, um, they start freemium too early. So what I mean by that is, unless you have like a growth hacker of a growth hacker or whatever we're calling them these days, or you have someone who is, um, there's some viral efficiency out of, you know, a freemium model, you probably shouldn't start freemium until you're like three, four years into the business. When you're starting to realize, hey, this is how we are going to convert people. We already know how to do it. We know who it is. And now we just want to open up the top of the funnel in order to get more leads, like AKA that premium ebook. The other thing that they do is that they, oftentimes will make freemium too much of a cheap version of their product. It has to be full featured. It can't be something that's weak. You have to keep in mind that people are coming in and like seeing your product. And this is the you know, first impression in a lot of cases of what they can expect. So if it 
looks cheap or it doesn't work or there's problems with it, you know, people aren't going to stick around and there's no way they're going to want to talk to you. Um, mm -hmm. We, I, and, you know, for context, I railed against freemium early in my career. So I was very anti freemium and then I saw the writing on the wall and now I have a fairly large freemium product. And the thing that we realize is that your freemium product has to be better than the paid alternatives in the market to work. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's one of those things that, um, is, is really, really important to kind of keep in mind. And then the third big thing that people get wrong with freemium is that they don't focus on the right type of freemium. So ProfitWell is, it's, it's, it's essentially a forever free model or a tangential free, which means we're attracting the right type of customer. We are um, giving them a ton of value, but we're not selling like a premium version version of our free product, we sell these different add-ons that help them and, and the free product kind of tells them, hey, you need this. And then, you know, they go find that other product. The other type of freemium is a faux free trial. So this is, hey, you get 10,000, you know, Slack messages or something like that. And as soon as you're like ready to convert, um, it's typically at a particular point. Um, for a lot of faux free trial, it's, you know, 14 to 21 days of your target customer using that product. They'll want to convert within that kind of artificial timeline. But if they don't, then it resets the next month um, and you can keep nurturing that lead. And the, the last thing I'll say, sorry, you got me, you put a quarter in me with freemium here. So. <laughs> is um, you, you can't look at just the first 30 days and determine if it's successful or not there. You have to look at essentially a cohort um, of, hey, this person came in free and then look at the first six months, 12 months of who all converted uh, mm -hmm. because that's, that's what really proves freemium's worth uh, because again, you're nurturing that lead and you kind of own that lead um, to nurture over time. And it's okay if they don't convert right away because you know, you'll get them eventually. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, what, what Slack was able to do is kind of move from, uh, you know, uh, a typical process of like MQL, SQL, SAL that a lot of enterprise software companies to actually use that premium offer and 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 the way that they market to develop like a, a product qualified lead, right? So where, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. they, they understand that the user's already qualified so they don't have to have a heavy sales team. They don't actually, Slack doesn't have a big uh, sales team the way a lot of enterprise software companies do with BDRs and, and AEs, right? They do a lot of paid search. Um, they have, you know, the, the right packaging and, and the, that freemium offer allows them to capture it without a whole lot of friction in the buyer journey. Um, so I think that's been, you know, really responsible for a lot of their growth. Um, I, I also, you, you know, in that article, I was kind of making the case that freemium is a good fit if you, you know, it's the best if you have a strong network effect like a Slack, right, uh, where people are selling it internally and getting value, yeah. you know, collaborative value. Um, also that the total addressable market's big enough, right? Obviously, if it's, you, know, you only have 300 customers uh, or potentially, then, you know, maybe it's not not mm. the best thing to think about. Um, and then lastly, you have to really do the work on the value metrics to delineate those different tiers like you were talking about, which mm. Slack did a great job of. But let's just talk generally about this year. I mean, it's been a challenging year for a lot of companies, uh, subscription companies and, and other companies. Um, I think subscription companies have the benefit if they are providing value that you do have a, 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 a more dependable revenue stream than if you're selling, you know, widgets for, you know, one off things where people, you know, so you have that ongoing relationship. And and obviously, uh, if you have a model where it's easy for customers to turn it off and it's not as key, that that's different. Um, but but what are you seeing happen in 2020 around, you know, in the subscription pricing world in general um, that that, you know, it may be in response to this pandemic or but but just in general in 2020, what's yeah. what's hot, what's emerging? What are you seeing as you know, someone that has a lot of data and, and thinks deeply about these things? Totally. We we came out with this thing called the uh, this thing, this uh, the profitable index, which is. A, we basically aggregated everyone who's on ProfitWell and, um, you know, we, we can look at their data and aggregate it, not at any time individually, but we looked at what was growth looking like in the market and, and how did COVID basically impact um, different verticals. So mm -hmm. B2B, consumer, all these types of things, all in the subscription space, but depending on, you know, your business, you can extrapolate out a little bit. And so essentially, you know, anyone who was having anything to do with going outside, you know, obviously got hit really hard. Um, so people supporting restaurant software, gym, gyms and gym software, like all that kind of stuff got hit really hard. Mm -hmm. um, 
a lot of those folks did end up pivoting um, to either helping restaurants, you know, do uh, online orders, helping gyms do kind of remote fitness, these types of things. But, you know, everyone else, um, you had one group that just absolutely crushing it, those B2B companies that were there to help you transition uh, to working from home. So a lot of Slack and Zoom obviously is in the market, um, very, very, mm -hmm. you know, aggressively growing. And then everyone else what was really fascinating and, and we're all kind of in everyone else, right? Like a lot of us listening to this and including I think you and I, um, our businesses weren't going insane off of this and weren't getting crushed. What ended right. up happening is there was in B2B, there was like a four week pause basically in the market. So everything's going up and to the right. And then all of a sudden there's this four week just flat. Um, and what was interesting is when we broke that data down, it wasn't that new deals weren't happening, although there were some extended sales cycles. It was actually that everyone kind of went through everything in the spreadsheet and just kind of canceled the things that they probably should have canceled six months ago inside their businesses. And then all of a sudden after that four weeks, the whole market just went up and to the right again. So that's what's interesting with B2B. I think in terms of pricing in B2B, and I could talk about consumer in a second, pricing in B2B, I think a lot of brands, um, started experimenting with freemium or freemium like things you mm -hmm. saw a lot of extended contracts um and this was very reactionary and i don't know if they're doing this anymore because this was kind of in the the, the heart of q2 where they're all nervous and you know everyone's like i don't know how this is going to go and kind of now everything at least we've seen is kind of business as normal as normal as can be which is probably some gaslit thought in my head because obviously things aren't normal but uh <laughs> yeah it was kind of interesting we also saw a lot of people um who were getting kind of hit really get scrappy around their pricing models. They started mm -hmm. doing some lifetime deals, which normally I'm not a fan of, but nor but when you put your lifetime deal of your product ahead of where your lifetime value is, I mean, you can't complain, right? You know, because it extends your lifetime value and your essentially what your lifetime value is out of the customer. And then we saw a lot of people trying to do longer term contracts by giving some good healthy discounts, which again, you know, normally I'm like, ah, one to two months to get an annual up front is great, but you know, going to four to five, depending on your product, eh, I don't know, it's, it's a little scary still, but it might be okay, mm -hmm. again, depending on your circumstance. Consumer subscriptions just went out of control, like especially subscription e-commerce more specifically. Um, I think they, like the market was definitely growing slower than B2B, but all of a sudden just went, just went skyrocketed. Everyone was buying their, you know, subscription toilet paper. There's a really cool company right. called who gives a crap. Um, that's their actual name. <laughs> um, I love it. But they also, they also like donate, um, they build, uh, you know, facilities around the world of people who don't have plumbing. But, um, and then all of a sudden they got hit really hard with their retention because, they had a lot of new customers those first couple of months, and then all of a sudden, you know, there was a bit of a drop off. So, yeah, because um, yeah, I think you can get it in the store at that point. Yeah, after those first couple of months. Yeah, I, guess, I right? think. Yeah. yeah, and a lot of a lot of those companies, they're so acquisition heavy because it's e-commerce and it's very competitive. So a lot of their resources, even more so than B two B, go there. I, I will say that over, and then their retention just isn't as good. But I will say that overall, um, it's scary how okay it is. Um, and we've kind of seen this with the disconnect in the market and obviously a lot of people being unemployed and things like that. So I think for me, as, as kind of an economist, I, I look at this and I think, well, there's never been an economic downturn where there weren't aftershocks. Um, and I know this is a very unique, um, or this is just unique um, in the world, but uh, there probably will be some aftershocks, but normally aftershocks aren't as big as the initial shock. So we'll kind of see, and this is why economists always make predictions in the past. They never make them in the future because uh, it's complicated. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so that actually moves me to the next question, which is asking about, you know, what you see in the future for subscription pricing and monetization models. You know, lots happened over the last five to 10 years in this space, right? With, you know, subscription economy, as Laura likes to call it, uh, and more and more companies, you know, moving to these models but also just you know different monetization models uh, within subscriptions as well. What do you see? You know, you you probably have you know more more insight and more data into what's going on currently than than most uh, anyone in the world. Uh, so it'd be I'm just interested in you know, yeah. I guess I have you on the record here a little bit. So, uh -oh. but I I won't hold you hold you to it in ten years. But I'm just Let's wondering. Come what back you in ten years. I just know yeah. it. <laughs> um. It's a good question. I think we are going to get to a point where the subscription model turns into recurring revenue. So there's no actual subscription anymore, or there's, there, there isn't like 
$30 a month for X. Um, and the reason for that is kind of going back to the value metric conversation. If you just look at, you know, the, the history of that, well, we used to just charge for one-time purchases, you know, in the 90s. And then the first couple of pieces of software that allowed for recurring billing, um, it was still kind of just like very transactional. And then it turned into into, well, we can kind of measure users' receipts, and that's kind of like the, the seats we used to sell with the professional software, so let's charge on that. And then in the past 10 years or so, we, we now can measure things. And the billing systems, you know, Zora, et cetera, they're now able to, you know, take that measurement and charge based on it in a very programmatic way. Um, and what's really funny is I think that billing is the thing that makes or breaks um, basically the development of subscription pricing models uh, mm -hmm. because they're the ones who make this relatively easy and you don't want your, no one, like even if you're large, you never want to like have a huge billing engineering team because you just don't think of how valuable it actually is. It, it can be very valuable. It's just, you think of it as like sunk costs, right? So I think mm -hmm. that what's going to happen is over time, it's going to get easier and easier and easier to measure um, a, a more precise type of, um, value metric. And I think what will happen is all of a sudden we'll go to the world of like AWS, um, which for those of you who don't know, you you only pay based strictly on usage. And you can mm -hmm. prepay, which you get a little bit of a discount, but you don't pay for like a set amount on a subscription basis. Right. And so it'll kind of be, I don't know if it'll get quite as like black mirror of you just pay for the little squeeze of toothpaste every day rather than paying yeah. for the whole tube. But I think that we're going to get to a world where, you know, you kind of have this like perfect equilibrium with your customer in terms of the actual value they're getting. And you saw some experiments with this. Here's a little funny anecdote. Um, I actually you know, found this out from Amy who leads the uh, subscription Institute over at Zora. She, um, she was telling me about uh, in Barcelona, and I don't think it's there anymore, but there's a theater that for an experiment um, is like a comedy theater. What they did is they put cameras on the back of the chairs, so it was facing your face. And what they would do at the end of the show is they would say, cool, you have to pay for the show. Here's how much you would have you to laughed. pay based on the amount of times you laughed, and here's like the yeah. flat rate. And they let someone, yeah. they let them choose what they wanted to pay. Um, yeah. and it was more of like an art experiment, but yeah. it's, it's it's not crazy to think, and, and that gets a little nickel and dimey, of course, but um, right. it's it makes you think and imagine what the world is. But I think that's going to be the future um, as we can measure. And then I think I think beyond that, I think pricing, there's probably, I don't know if pricing becomes like a specific role in uh, certain subscription companies. I think once you get big enough, you always have like a pricing team or there's a pricing person or something on the team. Mm -hmm. um, I think it'll become more ingrained within products or more ingrained within, you know, kind of marketing again. Um, mm -hmm. I think there will be, you know, more hires on monetization and they might be under, you know, depends on how this, the, the marketing and growth teams evolve, but you'll probably will have like more pricing specialists of some sort um, inside companies earlier in their life cycle rather than waiting until they're, you know, public like or hundred million plus, I think it'll happen earlier just because, you know, it's getting harder and harder to grow. And, you know, these two other levers of monetization or retention have, haven't gotten a lot of attention in the world of subscriptions. Um, even now they don't get a ton of attention, um, but they're getting more attention than they were five years ago, which is always good. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, things are going in the right direction and <clears throat> hopefully this, uh, you know, this and other, uh, things that we do out there in the world, people will listen to and, and it'll get more and more, more traction. That's the goal, right? That's um, exactly so, right. yeah, so, so, but I've seen some interesting monetization models in, in places where you wouldn't necessarily think are, uh, you know, ripe for innovation. So one of our customers is a water treatment chemicals customer, mm -hmm. and they're actually doing pricing based on, uh, not consumption of their own product, but how many gallons of water their customers are treating. Right. That's and great. their customers are actually measuring it, reporting it back. And then they have a really consistent way of knowing what their cost base is going to be. That's uh, great. and. And they just give them back, yeah, the the report and say that's okay, the value. Yeah. The value right. is the the cleaned water. So that's yeah. cool. I like that. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I also had heard about that paper laugh kind of uh, experiment. That's that's an interesting one, but probably taking it a little bit too far. But but gives you it's thought provoking, right? It's interesting. Yeah, it, like it allows you to like imagine like oh maybe we can go beyond per seat, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you know stuff exactly. like that. Yeah, absolutely. So, okay, we're about to wrap up, but uh, I like to ask guests about you know your favorite website, books, blogs, uh, anything that you've read recently that you love or wanted to, want to share, either business wise or personal. Yeah, uh, I so the one I always say when when I get I get I've been asked this question before is uh, high output management from uh, Andy Grove. Um, I'm the biggest 
Grove Acolyte, I guess. Um, he's, he's since passed, but it's, um, it's just one of those books. I read it about twice a year. It, it goes into like, like he ran Intel for a long time and it, he goes into a large organization as well as like, as you're growing in a large organization, the lessons um, that you should take about um, how to manage, you know, what makes the best management style, um, a bunch of different things. And he wrote it basically before email was a thing. Uh, that's what's kind of funny because the preface of the newest edition basically talks about, hey, there's two big things that have happened since, you know, I wrote the edition. And one of them was about Intel and the other one was about email. This will probably change how we manage and things like that. So it, it, it's one of those things where you can get a lot out of like, oh, these are the fundamentals and the fundamentals don't really change. And I, you know, it, it's a book that does that very succinctly without a lot of fluff. And yeah, there's anecdotes, but it's not like, um, you know, some of the business books you read where you probably could have summarized it in 10 pages rather than reading the whole thing. So yeah. that's a good one that I would recommend. Cool. Well, thanks a lot for, for that and uh, your time and insight overall. My email address is patrick at profwell.com. If you ever want to get a hold of me, sometimes it takes a little bit to get to, to get back to you, but I always get back to everyone, or at least uh, I think I do. Um, and if you, you know, if you've, wondering something about subscription pricing or pricing in general, very similar to the price effects folks. There's probably something out there um, that we've written. So don't be afraid to hit us up um, and, and, you know, we can save you some time in terms of your research, but yeah, appreciate the time and uh, let me know yeah. if I can help with anything else. All right. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Patrick. And uh, thanks everyone for tuning in to pricing matters.